All right. So we left off talking about uh, electron configuration <clears throat> and talking about uh, valence electrons and all of this information like that. And this is important because when we think about <laughs> the trends on the periodic table, uh, all of, well, not all of them, but the majority of those trends are based on, in some way, the valence electrons of a given atom, right? So we're gonna talk about that today, uh, talking about these periodic trends. The first one we're gonna talk about is here, so electronegativity, and this is the 25th. All right, so electronegativity is the, by definition, is the measure of an atom's tendency to attract and form bonds with other atoms, right? With a, using electrons. And so electronegativity is, when we think about it in terms of bonding, is more a consequence of covalent bonds, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, but the trend is this way, right? So you can see here, it increases going from left to right. <clears throat> excuse me, and it increases going from bottom to top. So left to right, bottom to top, and it's increasing. And what, what electronegativity really measures is the, the ability of an atom to hold on to its electrons, right? We're gonna talk, kind of talk about that with some of the other trends, uh, but the ability of that atom to hold on to its uh, electrons. And, and the more, what you'll find is that the more electronegative atoms hold their electrons closer to the nucleus and less electronegative atoms have uh, more electron shells. And so the, the valence electrons end up further away from the nucleus and they don't hold on to them as tight. All right, so if we look at, if we're doing a comparison between, let's say, carbon and fluorine, right? If, if, if electronegativity is increasing in this direction, that means that fluorine is more electronegative than carbon. Fluorine is actually the most electronegative atom on the periodic table it has an electronegativity. And this is a measurable uh, observation. This has an electronegativity of 4.0. Oxygen is the second most electronegative atom with an electronegativity of 3.5. Right now, there are actually several periodic tables that just show the atoms and their electronegativity. <clears throat> so it's increasing across from left to right with fluorine being the most electronegative, right? And then if you look from top to bottom, if we look at, let's say fluorine and iodine, fluorine is more electronegative than iodine because it's further up the group, right? So it increases from bottom to top in a group and from left to right across a period. And we're gonna talk about like why that is and all of that uh, when we start talking about electron affinity and atomic radius. So we'll, we'll make that more plain. So in this group right here, let's say from oxygen down to polonium, polonium would be the least electronegative and it's on the table. Uh, oxygen will will be the most electronegative, right? In that, in that column or in that group. So you go from, again, bottom to top and then from left to right. If we were comparing silicon and phosphorus, right? Because phosphorus is to the right of silicon, this is more electronegative, that's less electronegative. So that trend is important, very, very important, especially when it comes to uh, covalent bonding. So let's talk about that for a second, because the electronegativity 
actually controls how covalently bound compounds like react with one another. So when we think about this in terms of covalent bonding, let's say I have a bond between carbon and fluorine. So with fluorine being much more electronegative than carbon, this creates what we call a dipole, right? So that, the way we illustrate that is put an arrow here and the dipole indicates that there's some type of charge separation. Right, so if there's a dipole, if there are two atoms <coughs> with greatly different electronegativities like carbon and, and fluorine, I think carbon is 2.5 and fluorine is uh, 4.0. So we can look at that. So the electronegativity for carbon is 2.5. The electronegativity for fluorine is 4.0. So if we take the difference in those two, it's 1.5, right? So this number indicates that the carbon fluorine bond is what we call polar covalent. It's a polar covalent bond. And if you remember from way back when we were studying compounds, when we were talking about ionic compounds and covalent compounds, covalent is a is a word that simply if you break it down co meaning shared valent meaning valence so this means that they're shared electrons between two atoms right so that bond every bond is made up of two electrons we're going to see that shortly when we look at the lewis lewis structures so dipole this there's a dipole here there's charge separation and anytime there's a dipole one of your atoms is going to be partially negative and one's going to be partially positive. So we're going to make carbon because what this arrow indicates is that the electrons are going away from carbon to the more electronegative atom. So this is going to be partially negative. That's a lowercase Greek delta. And then this is partially positive. So those, the electronegativity is responsible for creating polarity and polarity controls reactivity. So with this compound, if it was reacting with something, uh, if, it, if it's reacting with something positive, it's gonna react through the negative end. If it reacts with something negative, it'll react through the positive end. So that's why electronegativity is so important because when, the, when you create polarity, you also, uh, you also dictate like reactivity. So this thing is gonna react a certain way because of that polarity. All right, so when we think about electronegativity, again, it's increasing from left to right, and it's increasing from bottom to top. <clears throat> All right, let's, um, any questions about electronegativity? So any, any two atoms you put together with a covalent bond, which we're gonna talk about shortly, any two atoms you put together, the electronegativity between those two atoms is gonna dictate which direction that dipole is facing and which atom is, the, and that is gonna tell you which atom is more electronegative. All right, let's look at another periodic trend. So another periodic trend is ionization energy, which is tied to electronegativity in the sense that ionization energy is the energy necessary to remove an electron from a neutral atom. So this morning I used the example, if I went from uh, calcium zero to calcium two, uh, one plus, let's just say plus one, plus one electron, right? It costs energy to get rid of that uh, electron or to, or to get it to, to expel it from that atom. If you notice the trend, it mirrors electronegativity. It increases from left to right and from bottom to top, it increases. So it kind of mirrors electronegativity. And if you think about it, 
if electronegativity, if I if we sum that definition up by saying it's the ability of an atom to hold on to its electrons, uh, you you might expect that a more electronegative atom is going to be harder to ionize. It's going to be harder to pull off uh, an electron from that atom because it's more electronegative. So we look at, let's say, if we compare the ionization energy of carbon to fluorine, right? With fluorine, it's going to cost more energy to ionize that. Right, because, and again, you think about it in terms of electronegativity, fluorine being more electronegative is holding on more tightly to its, to its electrons. So it's harder to get an electron away from fluorine. Carbon, on the other hand, is not holding on to its electrons as tightly. And what that means is that it's easier to ionize. It's still difficult because it's further to the right. And you can see the ionization energy increases from left to right. So, so it's not easy but it's, a, it's, a, it's more difficult to uh, remove an electron from fluorine than it would be from carbon. All right, now let me ask this question because we're talking about removing electrons. Where do you, you think those electrons are coming from? Do they come from the inner shell or do you think they're coming from the valence shell? All right, are they closer to the nucleus or are they further away from the nucleus? That's a, that's a better way to phrase that question. Further. Say it again. Further. Further away, good. So in, anytime you remove an electron, that removal is always gonna happen in the valence shell. Always the valence electrons. The, the electrons that are not <clears throat> valence electrons are closer to the nucleus. And keep in mind, just think about this in terms of, like, let's just rational, rationalize this out. <clears throat> if the nucleus is positive and the electron is negative and they attract one another, the closer the electrons are to the nucleus, right, the more attracted they're going to be to the nucleus. So the valence electrons being the furthest ones away from the nucleus are the easiest ones to manipulate. So any reactivity is gonna happen in the valence shell. If you make a bond with another atom, if you make a bond or you, you make an ion and uh, you got two ionic compounds, formation of that ion is gonna come from the loss of electrons or the gain of electrons in the valence shell, not any of, any of the other shells because they're lower in energy, they're more stable and they're less apt to either receive or give away uh, electrons. So anytime you ionize an atom, and in other words, make it into an ion, you're gonna do that by removing electrons or adding electrons to the valence shell. And this is strictly, this definition is strictly dealing with cations. Removing electrons always will always give you a, a cation, a plus charge. But it, again, it mirrors electronegativity in that the, the trend is from left to right and from bottom to top. So the more electronegative an atom is, the less ionizable it's gonna be. So let's put that up here. I'm gonna put this in quotes. The less ionizable, less easy to, to manipulate those electrons, all right? Another periodic trend is electron affinity. And this is the ability of an atom to accept an electron. So ionization energy is, is to remove an electron. Electron affinity is to accept an electron. But if you notice, it's the same trend, right? It's left to right, bottom to top. <clears throat> and again, it mirrors electronegativity. And when you think about 
what this means, think about the fact that, excuse me, a more electromagnetic atom is going to desire electrons. I know this, they don't like, well, some people don't like when you kind of um, personify atoms and make them, give them like th these uh, human characteristics. But I mean, it's easy to think about. Electromagnetic atoms love electrons. And so if you're gonna add an electron to an atom, then it makes sense that if it's a more electronegative atom, it's more willing to accept that electron. And if it's a less electronegative atom, it's less willing to uh, accept an electron, right? So electron affinity, ionization energy, and electronegativity all follow the same pattern. They increase from left to right and they increase from bottom to top, all right? And then there's one other uh, trend that we need to know. And these are all, and the reason why we, I picked these is because when you get to your upper level courses, we start taking GChem part two, organic and things like that. Like these are, uh, these are terms that you're gonna hear frequently, especially when you start talking about reactions between atoms, All right? So when you think about atomic radius, look at the trend, All right? For atomic radius, look at the trend. It is increasing from right to left and it increases from top to bottom, All right? Now this, this may seem counterintuitive, uh, but it's really not. When you think about, so what the electron, uh, the uh, atomic radius is, is half the distance, so that's a radii, between the nuclei of two atoms. So if you have two, uh, like a diatomic species and the two nuclei are uh, there and the valence shells are overlapping, then there's a distance between those two nuclei. So half the distance between that is what we call the atomic radius. Um, and so when you think about this in terms of what the other trends, uh, what we learn from the other trends, let's think about it this way, right? So we, so if atomic radius is increasing from right to left, this is also decreasing electronegativity. Decrease in electronegativity, which matters because we just talked about electronegativity being kind of a function of how tightly uh, electrons are attracted or, or bound, held to an atom and how attracted they are to the nucleus of that atom, right? So as electronegativity decreases, right, electrons are held less tight to the, to the, uh, to the nucleus. Right. So, so that means that the, the shells that the electrons exist in, which we've already talked about, the 1s and 2s and 2p and 3s and 3p, those shells get further and further away from the nucleus as electronegativity decreases. Right. So, if you look over here, we can say, for, let's say, for instance, if we're comparing. Uh, boron to fluorine, you can see immediately like, that the atomic radius of boron is larger than that of fluorine. Right now, let's let's think about that in terms of electronegativity. Which of those two atoms is the most electronegative? Fluorine or boron? Based on the trend. Trend is left to right increasing electronegativity. Which one is more electronegative? All right, so fluorine is going to be more electronegative. 
All right, so, so what that means for fluorine is that those shells that the where the electrons are are a little closer to the nucleus. And as you as you move across the periodic table to the to the left, from right to left, those shells start to get further and further away from the nucleus. And again, the atomic radius increases. Right? And then you see the same thing going. So across a period, you can see that. But even down a group, like if I'm if I'm looking here in this group right here, notice <clears throat> beryllium has an atomic number of four. That means it has four electrons, right? Look at uh, radium at the bottom and tell me how many electrons radium has. So beryllium has an atomic number of four. Radium has an atomic number of 88. What that means, if we, if we were to draw this like a, give an example, so this would be beryllium. This would be radium. Right, and the reason is because if you've got 88 electrons, that means you filled up several orbitals from starting at 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, like so on and so forth, right? You filled all those orbitals up. And so if you have 88 electrons, those, those valence electrons are gonna be like really far away from the nucleus. So that's why down, down a, a, a group, the atomic radius increases because you have more electrons, they have more shells, and the shells are further away from the nucleus. So more electrons means more shells. This is further from the nucleus. All right. So that's why atomic radius increases down a, down a group. And that's also the same thing across a period. It's not necessarily based on the shells, <laughs> more so than it is the electronegativity. All right, any questions about, about any of these trends? So electronegativity, electron affinity, uh, ionization energy, or atomic radius. All right, so the last thing we're gonna talk about is drawing Lewis structures. Right, so, and so this is tie, all this ties in together because the Lewis structures that we're gonna be drawing are gonna be for covalent compounds. And these are, these are, this is a way to depict how compounds bond covalently with, with each other. So this is for all right there are uh, ways to draw Lewis structures for ionic compounds, but we're not going to do that because you'll learn that in part two. Um, and there's a there's a process for this. If you watch that little video I sent you last night, there's a process for it. So step one you add up all the valence electrons, right? So count the number of valence electrons. This is why it's important to understand electron configuration. Anytime you make a bond with another atom and you bond according to what's called valence bond theory, where the two atoms get close enough that the valence shells overlap and they can share electrons. Anytime you do that, it's gonna happen in the valence shell, right? Bonding, any type of covalent bonding always happens in the valence shell. So let me, let me put that in here. There's another, uh, another concept 
concept about bonding molecular orbital theory, but and it still involves the outer shell electrons, but it also involves mixing of certain orbitals to make certain types of new orbitals that can bond, but we're not going to talk about that. So, so we're going to say that covalent bonding occurs in the valence shell. All right. So we can we count up the number of valence electrons. We write a kind of a depiction or a skeleton structure. Um, and we always put the least ele electronegative atom in the middle. And the only exception to this is hydrogen. That will never be a central atom. Right, hydrogen is always an outside atom. It's always attached to something, but it can only make one bond because it only has one valence electron. So it's not going to uh, be a central atom ever. All right, then we, then we take the electrons and the, after we've added up all the valence electrons, we put a pair of electrons between, every, between the atoms, right? And that's where our, our covalent bonds come from. Every bond, Every covalent bond is made up of two electrons. So I got to say covalent. So every covalent bond consists of two electrons. And then you do, you complete what's called the octet for atoms. And that, that octet means that When we talk about the octet rule, and I'm sure you've heard this in high school uh, when you took chemistry in high school, but basically in a nutshell, the octet rule says that every atom wants eight electrons. And, and it, it wants those eight electrons to mimic the closest noble gas. So if we go back up here, let's just look at this periodic table. This group right here, group A, right? Group A is, these are the noble gases. Helium, neon, <clears throat> argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, right? All of these group A elements, they all have eight valence electrons. That's why they don't react. All of them do. So they're inert. All of these gases are inert. They don't react with anything. They just, I said this morning, it, the reason they call them noble is because they don't interact with anything. It's kind of, I, I used the example this morning of the Queen of England, how she doesn't really do anything, she just shows up with stuff, waves, and then goes back to the castle, right? That's, that's the noble gases that they don't react. And so every atom, when it bonds with another atom, it's trying to, it, the reason it bonds is because it's trying to get to that octet or that eight, eight electrons surrounding it so that it can be uh, stable. Because everything in chemistry is a matter of stability. Ha everything happens to go from a, less stable state to a more stable state. All right, so let's go down here and then the fifth step talks about uh, using up the valence electrons. Uh, and if you don't have an octet, then you can make multiple bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, so on and so forth. So let's take a couple of these examples. We're gonna start with, uh, we're gonna start with, uh, PBR5, which is letter D. We've got 10 minutes left, 11 minutes. So let me put a page in. Uh, 
and we're going to walk through this uh, process with a few, with quite a, we're going to do uh, several of these. All right. So let's go to here. Let's take that PBR5. And what first thing we want to do is add up the valence electrons. So phosphorus, and, and if we look at the periodic table, the, num the group numbers tell us the number of valence electrons. All right, so this is group three. Carbon is group four. Let me let me go to a different one. That is not marked up. This is group three. Carbon is group four. This is group five. Oxygen is group six. All right. I Obviously helium doesn't have eight uh, valence electrons, but it's still considered a noble gas because it has two and it doesn't bond to anything. It's got two electrons in, in the 1s2. So it's a field uh, 1s2 orbital, right? But the group numbers tell us the number of valence electrons. So phosphorus is right here under nitrogen. So that's group five. And then chlorine is over here in group seven. So phosphorus is going to have, have five, elect five valence electrons. And then so it's got five valence electrons. And there's only one phosphorus here. So we're going to say that this is five electrons. And then chlorine has seven valence electrons, but there are five of them. Oh, I'm sorry, bromine. Well, we can actually make this. No, nah, I'm not gonna do that. I'll keep it. But bromine is in the same group as chlorine. It's in the same group, it's just one atom down. So it's, it's got the same properties and the same number of valence electrons. So we've got seven valence electrons times five bromine atoms. And that is 35 electrons. So the total is 40 electrons. So we got 40 electrons to use up to, uh, to show this compound, right? And so with PBR5, this is, I, I picked this one first because it's an exception, right? So let's, let's, let's draw it. So here in the second step, it says write a skeleton structure. So we're gonna write out Phosphorus is less electronegative than bromine. So we're gonna put that in the middle. And then we're gonna put five electrons around it. All right, and then we're gonna put bromine here. And each one of those, we're gonna put a, an electron. All right, so now we have five covalent bonds here that we can use up. So we've used up 10 of the 40 electrons because there, there are two electrons in each one of those bonds and we've got five bonds. So we're gonna subtract out 10 electrons. Now we got 30 left, All right? In this case, we can't make any more bonds. <laughs> and so those 30, we're gonna use as lone pairs or non-bonding electrons. All right. And, and since we, since phosphorus, if you notice, Phosphorus has actually has 10 electrons around it. So it, it, it has what we call an expanded octet. So this is one of, one of your exceptions to the octet rule. All right? So it's an exception. But it's fine. So phosphorus has 10 electrons, and then the other 30, since we're going to use them as long pairs, we're not going to put them on phosphorus. 
we're going to complete the octets of all the bromines. So you can see right here, bromine has two because of the bond, and it needs six more to have an octet. So we're going to put in a long pairs here. So that's this is two, four, six, and then the bond makes eight. And then we're going to complete the octets of all of these. And what you'll see is that we'll use up those 30 electrons. We got five bromines, and we're going to put six electrons around each. Right? And so all of your all of your atoms now have an octet, and there are no electrons left. So we can say here minus 30 electrons. So we got zero electrons left, nothing left, right? So the actual structure of this looks like this, where this is. We can write in the covalent bonds. It's just straight lines. And I'm gonna draw it this way first. So this is BR, BR, like that. I'll put my long pairs back in. Right? And that that shape, if we if we were to draw this in 3D, it actually would look like this, where this is on a wedge line, like coming out of the page. The other bromine would be on a dashed line going back into the page. And this would be on a horizontal line, like straight in the plane. And then the other two bromines are here to here. And even though we're not studying uh, Vesper theory, <clears throat> this, this geometry is what you call trigonal biparameter. You can see that there's kind of a triangle right here. And above it and below it, you have a bromine. So this is. This geometry is trigonal bipyramidal. All right. Or, or sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as TVP. So that's the that's the Lewis structure for uh, phosphorus tetrabromide. Let's do one more. Let's do uh, CCL4, carbon tetrachloride. Let's do that. Because this is, out of all, all these, this is the easiest one to illustrate. So we're, we're going to do carbon tetrachloride. And then let's count up the valence electrons. Carbon is in group four. So it's got four valence electrons. So that's four electrons there. And then chlorine, group seven, seven valence electrons. Then you got four of those. So we'll multiply that by four. So we got 28 electrons there. So we have a total of 32 electrons. Right? So now we We've counted up our, our valence electrons. We can make our little structure and we can put the electrons around the atoms to make our bond. So let's do that. So carbon is in the center because it's less electronegative and chlorine is here, 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 and here. And each one of these, we're gonna put two electrons. Like that. So now we have four covalent bonds between carbon and chlorine. And we've used up eight electrons because each one of those bonds takes two electrons. So we're gonna subtract that out over here. So this is gonna be 24 electrons left. Now we got four, elect four chlorines. And one of the things about group seven and one of the things about the periodic table, the reason why it's organized the way it is, because a lot of the atoms behave all the same way down a group. That's why they're grouped up how they are. So just like the bromine up here, we took what was left because we can't make any more bonds. So we took what's left, what was left. And we made um, lone pairs. We're gonna do the same thing here. So we got 24 
uh, electrons left, we got four chlorine atoms. And since it's group seven, we're gonna put those six here, right? So now you can see chlorine has an octet. It's got three long pairs and then one bond. So that's eight. We're gonna do the same thing with the other chlorines. And then here as well, right? So now, now we've used up all of our electrons. This is, let's say, minus 24. No electrons left. And this, this is the structure for carbon tetrachloride. Normally, you don't show it with the dots, right? You show it with the lines because these are covalent bonds. So we just write it like this. Same thing this morning with chlorine. And then you show your long pairs like so. All right, so when we do that, <clears throat> if we were to show the actual shape of this, carbon has a, a specific type of geometry where this is on a wedge or coming out of the page. This is going back into the page. And this is flat with the page. So this is it's kind of sloppy. Hold up. So there's a chlorine at each one of these. And the geometry here is tetrahedral. Very important for organic. It's a tetrahedral geometry. All right, so with the Lewis structures, the key is to find out uh, how many valence electrons are available. And once you do that, you can start build, start constructing like these little the models. <clears throat> and once you make your covalent bonds, the next most important part is to ensure that everything has an octet. There are some exceptions, like boron is an exception. So BCL3 up here, let me just show you that. That actually looks like this, where you have, uh, come on. Boron with three bonds to chlorine. And you can see immediately that these three bonds, boron only has six electrons around. But it's okay having not having an octet. That's another example of uh, an exception to the octet rule. All right, any questions about anything? All right, so we're gonna stop here. Um, uh, this is our last lecture, but if you have questions in the meantime, and uh, you, you, you need to get in touch with me, y'all have my number, I have my email address, so I'm not hard to find. Uh, it's been a good semester. I appreciate y'all's uh, work and continuing to come and continuing to uh, stay on the grind, and yeah. Uh, the, the final will be posted, uh, I think it's from 8 to 10 on, on uh, May 2nd. It's either 8 to 10 or 1 to 3. Because uh, the part, the uh, first section, their final, I think, is on Wednesday. But I think the time is either 8 to 10 or 1. To, if you go and look at the announcement, I posted the schedule. So you should be able to look at the announcement and find that. But it's on, it's on May 2nd. All right, any questions about anything?